Happy Fourth of July. Happy Independence Day. 244 years ago, our nation became an independent nation. Sure, we made some mistakes, but we did some good things too. So let's celebrate the good things. At this time, I'm gonna introduce and share with you Sandy Hawley, who's been the church secretary for 20 plus years. She was always loyal, faithful, positive, and, and an upper. So I've asked her to come and share her life with us. Sandy? Thank you, Paul. My name is Sandra Hawley, and I have a passion for adoption. I don't remember much about my early life as a child, just what I have been told. I was one of nine children, six girls and three boys. Our biological father was an electrician for the railroad. Our mother was a housewife. When they could no longer care for us, three younger girls, the authorities took us away from our parents and placed us in foster homes. The first time we were taken away, before Diane was born, Pat, my older sister, lived with two of our older sisters, and I lived with the oldest sister. Second time we were put in foster homes, Pat and Diane in separate homes in Taft, California, and I was in foster care in Lost Hills, not far from Pat. I remember going to live with the Coles, our adopted parents, at Fina, California, approximately 25 miles east of Bakersfield, at around the age of five to five and a half years old. Diane went to as a foster child first. I was the second to live with the Coles and Pat came a little later. We were the only children to live with the Coles at the time. In later years, they took in more foster children. When Pat was 12, I was six, and Diane was three years old. In 1951, we were adopted by the Coles. They told the authorities they wanted to adopt all of us together, and if they couldn't have us three stay together, they didn't want to adopt us. When we were taken away from our real parents, we were taken to a hospital with chicken pox. We were very sick. The Coles were the first, were the most wonderful parents we could have had. We had a wonderful childhood. Our adopted father worked in the, for the Southern Pacific Railroad as a section foreman. His territory was from Bakersfield to Tehachapi. We lived in the country with several houses around us that the workers who lived, worked for our dad and their families lived in. They were called section houses. The foreman got the biggest house. The house we live in, lived in at Vena was one of the first railroad depots in Kern County. It is now in the Pioneer Village Museum in Bakersfield, reconstructed as a depot. There were times when aunts and uncles from both sides of the family lived in these section houses. Our uncles worked for our dad. These were fun times because we had family of close and we had cousins to play with and fight with. Pat and I rode the bus into Edison, approximately 10 miles to attend elementary school. We lived so far from school, we were the first ones on the bus in the morning and the last ones off in the afternoon. I will never forget Mr. Potts, our bus driver. He was a very nice man. He once, maybe more, told my mom, Mrs. Cole, I can't get Sandra to sit, stay seated on the bus. I was a very nervous child, good excuse. We had some great times at Bina. One thing I remember was getting to go into Bakersfield every two weeks with dad, when dad got paid with our folks to get groceries at Safeway. I can still smell the fresh ground coffee mom ground in the store. Dad bought us baby chicks to raise. One Easter, he bought each of us girls a colored baby chick of our own. We were so proud of those chicks. We thought their feathers would stay the color they were. They didn't realize, we didn't realize their feathers would turn white as they grew. When they were old enough, he would kill them and mom would prepare them for the freezer. When we could, could we went into the fields and orchards and picked fruits and vegetables for the freezer. Mom always kept our freezer stocked full. We had a lot of great family dinners. In 1957, we moved to Long Pine, California. Our dad had gotten transferred by the railroad. We lived there a short time. I did not like it there. I lived like, we lived like pioneers. We had no television because the reception was so bad. Yes, there was television back then. 
We cooked on a wood stove because there was no natural gas or butane. When we moved to Cam then we moved to Cameron, California. I remember waiting for the bus in the snow there. From there we moved to Mojave, California. I did not like it there either. I did not like the school. The kids were very mean. We moved a lot because of dad's job. From there we moved to Pixie, California. I went through seventh and eighth grade there and graduated eighth grade from Pixley Elementary. From there we moved to Exeter, California. One week before I started my freshman year of high school, I did not, I did not know anyone. I walked six blocks to school. I will never forget going to Exeter High that first day. I was scared to death. Some senior girls took me under their wings, helping me get acquainted. I enjoyed high school in Exeter. I was in the choir. I worked I walked to school with my close friend, Louise Strong. We became good friends. She told me she had a boyfriend named Carl, and she was afraid he was getting too serious about her. I just jokingly said to her, introduce me to him. And she said to me, come to church with me and I will. I went to church with her and she introduced us. Our church youth group took a trip to Lodge Pole in the Sequoias to go ice skating. I rode home with Carl in his 1963 white Corvair with red interior. We went to the preacher's house after for cookies and hot chocolate. When we got ready to leave, Louise said, Carl is going to take us home. He should have taken her home first because my house was closer. He should have taken me home first because my house was closer. But he took her home first. I will always believe Louise had a lot to do with this. When he took me home, he asked me if I would like to go on a date. Of course, I said yes. We started going together in June of 1963 and we married in September of 1963. The little church we were married in, in Exeter, is still there. We went to Northern California for four days on our honeymoon. We didn't stay gone long because Carl was working with his dad doing farm work. Carl's folks helped us with down payment on a little house on Denver Street in Lindsay. We bought the house in 1964. It was fully furnished, even to the lawnmower and cooler. We fell in love with the house as soon as we saw it. I remember when we walked in the front door, I couldn't believe how big the kitchen was. I told Carl, we have to have this. Ha this. It is too good a buy to turn down. Our house payments were $65 a month. That did not include the taxes and insurance. We needed a bigger house because we were expecting our first baby to, in May. One of the first things I changed was the drapes in the living room. We were, they were black with large flowers on them. We had a lot of fun fixing the house up the way we wanted it. We couldn't get rid of any of the furniture until it was paid for. After we paid off the furniture, our payments went down to $45 a month. My sister Pat moved in with us. We really enjoyed having her live with us. On May 21st, 1965, we received the first joy of our lives. Our daughter, Pamela Jean, was born at Lindsay Hospital. She was spoiled rotten. Her Aunt Pat helped with this. She slept in the same room with Pat, and Pat would get ready for work, and before she left for work, she would make sure Pam was awake so she could play with her. When she went to work, she would bring her and put her in bed with me. Our house had a large backyard for Pamela and her friends to play in. Carl worked very hard to see we had everything we needed. He worked three jobs a day. He worked doing farm work during the day for several years. He worked at the Lindsay TV doing deliveries and repairs. When he finished, he would go out and change sprinklers in the groves. He had started working as soon as he was able to sit in the tractor seat. He was a very hard worker. On February 1st, 1968, the second joy of our lives, Carlene, the second joy of our lives came along. Carlene Renee was born. I said the first time I saw her, she has long slender fingers like her grandma Holly. When we brought her home from the hospital, her big sister Pam was next door playing with friends. When someone went to get her to come see her, New baby sister, she took one quick look at her and was ready to go back and play. They were very good girls. They had their moments just like any siblings do. They turned out to be wonderful adults. 
At this stage in my life, they have been a tremendous help to me. We had a very loving family life and have been blessed with two wonderful daughters, two great son-in-laws, seven grandchildren, and 14 great-grandchildren. In February of this year, we lost Carl to cancer. And in May, Diane, our youngest sister, passed away from the coronavirus. Three days later, we lost our next, the oldest sister. I thank God every day for the good life I have been given. I could have been raised in foster care until I was 18, but he gave me a wonderful, loving family to take care of me and to be raised with. Thank you, God. Thank you, Sandy. Let us pray. Almighty, eternal God, we are so thankful for Sandy and her commitment and her loyalty and her support of the church and Valley Christian community. Be with her and bless her and touch her. She has set an example for the rest of us to follow. We love her dearly. Thy name we pray, amen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. <clears throat> Stumbled a few times, I think. I'd like you to press the pause button and go get a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil. I want you to write down the verses I'm going to share with you today. I'm sure these verses you're probably not familiar with, and I'm going to interpret them and prophesy. So when they're all done, you look up the verses. How do you interpret them? How do you prophesy? I'd like to hear from you. I don't want to be a preacher of doom and gloom. I want to be a positive preacher. I want to encourage and help people. But I just feel I have to, I need to, say something about the chaos in our world today and share with you what I think is going on biblically speaking. It's my interpretation. The current world chaos is too well orchestrated to be a mere coincidence. When it all happens within the same week of each one, and there's cars there with bricks in them, which is prepared to throw at the cops. And some of the protesters don't even live in those towns. Somebody was behind it, somebody organized it, somebody paid for it. And it speaks of evil, a sinister force working behind the scenes to put down God's desire for peace and goodwill for all men. Not all students of Bible prophecy will agree with my interpretation today. Yet the scripture warns, Ephesians 6 verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. That's Ephesians 6, verse 12. Second Thessalonians 2 prophesies that in the last days, a villainous world leader, whom the Apostle Paul identifies as a man of lawlessness, will ascend to power out of nowhere. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or worshiped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. In my childhood, I grew up in a parsonage. My dad was a minister. We had visiting ministers and missionaries coming and going in the house all the time. And I heard preachers insist that someday, a devious, charismatic leader would usher the world into a global economy and a universal religion, a one world religion. This Satan inspired tyrant would promise peace and safety, but lead the whole world into chaos and war. Anyone who resists him would be ineligible and able to buy or sell anything and be bullied into submission. That idea is based on several scriptures. The Apostle Paul calls him the man of lawlessness who is doomed to destruction at 2 Thessalonians 
chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle John predicted the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. That's 1 John 2, verse 18. In the book of Revelation, he's identified as a beast coming out of the sea. The dragon, Satan, gave the beast his power and his throne and gave authority. And the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. That's Revelation 13, verses 2 to 7. The Antichrist will look wonderful, be charming and successful. He'll be the ultimate winner and appear as an angel of light. In this sense, the Antichrist will be a satanic messiah instead of the true Messiah of Jesus Christ. So today when I hear politics talk about global initiatives, international law, my spiritual antenna goes up. When the whole World Health Organization can shut down the entire planet for weeks with a warning of a pandemic, it's evidence of how receptive the world is to universal oversight and a one world government. It also demonstrates how vulnerable we are to embracing a charismatic leader who would promise assurance in the time of a panic. The Bible teaches the Antichrist's efforts to establish world peace will be as futile as the Tower of Babel was in the days shortly after Noah's flood. I'm inclined to believe several current events are Satan's preparation for the soon to surface the man of lawlessness. The first one is the breakdown of law and order. That day will not come until the rebellion occurs, until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Who would ever believe that a handful of anarchists could occupy six blocks of a major American city, including a police station, and the police vacate the premises and allow the subversives to take over? Or that city council would seriously entertain defunding the police? There's a widespread disrespect for civil authority now. I'm inclined to believe the current events are Satan's preparation for the soon to surface the man of lawlessness. The next event, the inversion of truth and falsehood. God sends them a powerful delusion so they will believe the lie. At 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 11. The Bible warns, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Today, what used to be right is now considered wrong. And what used to be wrong is now considered right. Church gatherings are now considered dangerous, unimportant, and non-essential. Yet massive protests are exempt and essential with no laws. Only the church is, has the laws, not the rioters. Immoral behavior is celebrated. Biblical commands are laughed at and ridiculed. The racism of Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, is ignored. Why Christopher Columbus is trash because of his racial beliefs that he said something 230 years ago. What inconsistency. Satan is a father of lies, the master of deceit. So all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. At 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 12. I call your attention to the third event. The elimination of nationalism. According to Acts 17, verses 26 and 27, God established national boundaries for our good 
and for our protection. Yet, for globalism to succeed, national pride must be eliminated, must become un-American. There seems to be a concerted effort to destroy America's spiritual heritage and tear down the heroes and be against anyone who's patriotic. Revolutionaries are posed to welcome a new, more system than the one offered in the land of the free and the home of the brave. The final prerequisite to a one world government is the rapture of the church. Now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus predicted in the last days many will depart from the faith and because of the increase of the wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Paul warned the time would come when preachers would not preach sound doctrine, but will say things that please people. Early efforts at regathering the church following the pandemic shutdown has not been encouraging. It's estimated an average of only 33% of churches have returned to worship. In the last days, the church will be so weakened by compromise that most members won't be able to distinguish between God's truth and Satan's lies. They will endorse Satan's irreligious agenda and get sucked into the lie that humans can save themselves through international cooperation and social engineering. In the end, the small remnant of believers who would offer strong resistance to the Antichrist will be abruptly raptured by Christ and taken out of this world. And glory, hallelujah, I'm looking forward to that ride. Are you? 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 7 and 8 reads, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. When the Holy Spirit, living in the hearts of believers, is taken out of the world, the strongest resistance to Satan's scheme will be removed and the way paved for him to take over. The good news is, the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. After a brief and bloody reign, the Antichrist is doomed to destruction along with those who have worshiped the beast. Then every knee will bow, every eye will see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Isaiah 2 verse 4 reads, and he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. A nation will not take up sword against a nation, nor will they train for war anymore. It's Isaiah 2, verse 4. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? I'm going to give you three verses now. Underline them in your Bible, or type them out, put them on your refrigerator so they can encourage you. 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15 reads, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm. Hold fast to the teachings we have passed on to you. One of my favorite verses, Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36, it reads, Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. The Bible gives a clear choice between two life directions. Throwing away our confident trust in Christ is one, or patiently persevere, persevering 
Christ to the very end. What's your choice? You must always take the better path, continuing to be with Christ, even though it looks more difficult and treacherous. The climb takes a toll on your energy. I know that. I suffer that myself. The way may get lonely, but not many on it. But more than you would imagine, some are there because of the example there are following you. It gets slippery when the devil's blowing ice on the narrow passage. Despite its dangers, the better path leads to the top. And you'll make it. God has a lifeline around you. I repeat, God has a lifeline around you. When you're tempted to falter in your faith or to turn back from following Christ, keep focus on what he's done for you and what he's promised for the future. So here's the point. Keep climbing. Keep climbing. Amen.